Okay, Namo Tassa. Namo Tassa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Samata, Sandarta. Namo Tassa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Samata. Namo Bhagavato, Arahato, Samata, Sandarta. Adu Sadu Sadu. This is the Pataliya Sutta number 53 and 54, I'm sorry. It's uh, now the Q&A, questions and answers. The floor is yours. Anybody have a question about this? I'm glad Ardika came because they had that little section in there about the itties. Hmm? Yeah. 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 Actually, yeah, I'm reading about it too. I'm so going to. I don't, what, did, what did it say where you were reading? What were you finding? Well, um, not yet. I'm, I'm going to reread it again because it seems like I really need to read it properly, like one by one. Mm -hmm. The big one oh. here is that for the conditions for the idiots to arise, they arise naturally. We don't make them arise. So what we're talking about is um, the, the potential for past lives, the potential for divine ear, for divine tongue, uh, for my favorite of all time, which I you know, still believe is possible, <laughs> passing through a wall <laughs> to the other side. The problem with passing through the wall is kind of a joke for me because uh, when I want to walk through a wall, it's impossible. I have to be gone in order to walk through the, the wall, which is the name of something that should not exist. You know, it's so there's it's impossible for my atoms to go through those atoms like that if I am still inside me. <laughs> Oh, so it, it's remarkable someone can get to that place of nothing touching them, not, no phones ringing, nothing. I can't see a person in the city being able to get to this place unless they have a lockbox they can sit in to stay for long periods of time without anything in order to get rid of everything. You see, it's a problem. Well... Well, about that, actually, sister, I, I, I kind of think that maybe to be able to understand, um, um, like, there is no wall at all, and there is actually, um, like, let's say that you, if you want to go to the wall, so we don't have, we need to have that perception of the wall. Well, maybe. The, wall, the wall is a concept. Right. I am a concept. So if I stop saying me or my, I still, this being is a concept. Yes. <laughs> a concept exactly. cannot pass through a concept. This is where I went with this thing. Yes, exactly. That's what I think. But probably there's another kinds of meditation. How, how about that, sister? You know, like let's say that when we want to radiate loving kindness, we have to cultivate the feeling of happiness. Okay, like that. now, maybe... that's a funny thing because um, in the in the Buddhist tradition, this is we were talking about this the other day, and the, the discussion went to happiness. I love it when the discussion goes to happiness because we forget that when a person is angry because they don't have happiness anymore. Now watch, they they um here they are. They have we'll do it with this little guy here. It's very small. Yeah, we'll do it with this. They have happiness. And now Perel tells me I lost my job. I don't have happiness, you see? But the question is, can you have happiness? Because the secret behind happiness matches what the Buddha said. Happiness is a byproduct of the way you and how your mind is. And in the Buddhist tradition, happiness comes after tranquility. So you have up and joy, joy fades away, you have tranquility, and then when tranquility fades away, then happiness comes up, Buddhist sukha. So in the Buddhist tradition, there's no vibration really in this happiness. It's a kind of really steady, wonderfully comfortable, flexible contentment, you see? 
it's better than any happiness that's out there. You know, the five kinds of joy. Well, those first experience, okay? And the other two for the meditation. Well, this is uh, this kind of happiness that we're talking about that you can achieve. It can only, you, you don't achieve it. It's something that naturally happens when the conditions are right. It's a byproduct. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Yes. So Monty that had to struggle to make me stop saying, I can get you happiness. I can help you have happiness. All this stuff. It's correct when we say, but it's not right. It's not right. right. I see, uh, I saw you raise his hand. Did Deepa question? You? Okay, well, Ardika, is there anything else can you say about that? No, actually, um, regarding the elements, I was, I was looking at the elements a uh, few months back, but these days I haven't gone through that again, especially practicing it. You see, like, there's the four big elements and actually the elements that we know, like let's say the fire, water, air, and this, uh, the earth. So the perception of the fire is not exactly a fire. So it's supposed to be a temperature while the water is supposed to be something that's connecting everything, not the water that is liquid. And the earth, so, so to be the earth and the air. So, when I look at this, actually, it's, it's, it's not easy to change the perception or the concept in our mind to get that, okay, water is actually connected. It's not the water of the water. The water is cohesion. Yes. It pulls things. Cohesion is the word. Yeah, no it's, cohesion, it's, right. not, it's, like, it's not like connecting to everything. But in its, its cohesion is um, what holds the water in place. Yeah, the water, the water is, um, okay, what I want you to do is, uh, let me see if I can remember how to explain this, get a bucket of water, uh, and you really need a bucket, fill the bucket up with water, put it in front of your chair, sit in the chair. Now put your, ha put your hand down in the bucket and tell me what the water feels like. Find the water. You you do this, and then next week you tell me what happened. Well, what I did back, I, I did that actually back that sister. So God, he did that to you, didn't he? <laughs> no, he did not. I, I I tried it by myself. So actually, when I put my hand in there and I asked myself, okay, I let let's feel the water. But then again, if I say, oh, let's feel the water, that means that, okay, the water is a water. Water that I know is a water, not the cohesion. See, the point is when you feel it, you can only, you, you tell me how you describe feeling water. That's where you get stuck. Well, feeling of water is like, there's a temperature. There you go. It's hot or it's hot cold, cold. Warm or cool. Yes. But that's right. not feeling the water, that's feeling the temperature. <laughs> yes, exactly. So in the water, actually, so what I understand, in the water, there are four elements. Mm -hmm. They have the temperature, they have the thickness and liquidity and everything, and even the movement. There's no earth element in the water. But it's pretty... No, it's not. Hang your foot, hang your hand in there and show me the earth element. Go ahead, try it. Go, go look at any of the descriptions you find in any of the Chinese writings or the, the other Buddhist writings. Look at the, with that element and tell me how they describe it. Okay. <laughs> That's why there's four elements. It's not, the earth element is not in there. The wind element is not in there. There's no air in that water. I thought that the air element is the one who, you know, like put all of these elements together, like, you know, hold it. 
Like, you know, small particles into one big particles and then hold no, the particles. Keep, keep investigating. Keep investigating. That's why oh. you have more elements. But the Buddha says five at least. And the fifth one is the consciousness. Oh, the consciousness, right. Yeah. And the other thing the Buddha did beyond what they were doing with the four great elements, he decided there's really six. And he teaches six elements, okay? Space. So the fifth one is uh, the uh, consciousness and the sixth one is space. Now, because the, because he teaches the elements, always teaches the elements in conjunction with your body. He teaches it very anatomically and very medically. He teaches the, the elements. So he wants to include, so if you open the person up and you're going to do an operation, what's inside? You know, there's solid stuff, okay? And then there's water. And then you have the heat element, okay? And then there's an air element. But then there's a space element between the two, between where the organs sit in the body. When you look inside the uh, the body, there's space to work in there, and that's the space element. See, mm -hmm. so he went two steps further in talking about this, and I thought I found that very interesting. And uh, the way he decides to do it is to teach it so you can recognize it, is to teach it in relationship to the body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty neat what he did. Um, I did. I see that you had a question. Yeah. No, somebody has a question. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Sarah, are you there? Hi, here. I'm just telling you who's outside that they can't hear you. That, uh, that you can't hear him. Oh, I can't hear him. Oh, he's talking yeah, out. He is, he is there. So let's let's try again. I'll mute myself. Okay. No, I, I don't have him. He's mute. So it's up to speak. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I can hear you oh, now. Okay. Okay. Um, in the sutra, it was talking about the equanimity that comes from diversity and comparing it to the equanimity from unity. Uh, I just, could you just uh, explain a little bit more about the equanimity from diversity that's not recommended? Okay, unity, un <laughs> it's real funny because that's what the Chinese actually called that conference, unity through diversity. And I never could, I worked for years trying to figure out what was meant I never came up with anything sensible from a dictionary, an encyclopedia, or great books to explain how there is unity in diversity. Um, there's acceptance of diversity, you can say that, but, um, and certainly it would be not, I, I can't figure out what they were trying to do except say a global thing where everybody's absolutely the same, something like that, I'm not sure. But in this case, what they're talking about in your meditation, um, is the equanimity uh, in unity to the present time. So your equanimity becomes perfect in, in, uh, in, in, in reference to the present time space that you do what you're doing. That's the way you think about this unity, okay? And unity of equanimity, when something's going on, you're totally balanced in the framework of this present time of what you're dealing with. But... Um, the other one is diversity. That would mean like you're in the hospital and you're attempting to take care of one serious situation with one patient, but then there's bells ringing and uh, a cart for a uh, code blue and everything's going off at once. Can you stay with that person in the emergency room with what you're doing? Knowing other people are going to go, but or is your mind going to go here, 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 here? You get it? That's what it's about. When yeah, but they, they, in the mm -hmm. sutra, it's in the sutra, it's talking about the equanimity of, from diversity, and I was wondering whether this was a comment on uh, diversity being, if you like, the scattered mind. If you momentarily uh, satisfy the scattered mind, you have a momentary equanimity, but it's not going to teach you anything. It's not going to show you anything. Well, it can show you that you're you're not taking anything personally and you're staying in the present time. That's what it shows you. So, you know, there's diversity around you as a test. Uh, it's a test. Well, I, I had to go to this big fair where there was a big, big 
harvest festival among thousands of people and I didn't want to go and I, I, I had to go. And so I went and it was pulling me in all directions is the diversity. And can I stay and see one and enjoy it one place at a time? You go, you go to an art museum, some people are experts at going to this art museum and really enjoying themselves with one thing. But if they, if they really wanted to see this museum all their life and they, their flights got messed up and they can only be there one day, their mind cannot be with, with Henry Thoreau and then be somewhere with another artist here and another artist. They're just, it's difficult. <laughs> this is how mm -hmm. I kind of, kind of explain it to you, um, how they're doing that, what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, Because it really has to do with the present time of where you are in this this equanimity in when you're living your life. And then it gets fractionalized, you fall into diversity, and then paralysis of analysis. <laughs> where it goes so it sounds to me it sounds to me a little bit like uh, what we're talking about there is the is the scattered mind, the mind that can't remain uh, uh, present with, with uh, one thing and, and, and we can have a satisfaction from a scattered mind, it can be entertained and so momentarily our desire if you like is satisfied but, uh, and we feel this momentary equanimity but then it, it's, not, uh, it's not long lasting and it doesn't actually teach us anything and as soon as we become scattered again uh we have exactly the same problems yeah it's like the child arriving at the fair and when they first get out of the car and they see all this stuff there oh i want to go there 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 mommy get enough tickets i gotta go here 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 everywhere <laughs> okay and mommy says okay i'm gonna get this many tickets and you each have this many and you can do things one at a time so mm -hmm. actually fairground is a good place to look at the difference between unity and mind can you enjoy the teacups spinning around before you go on the roller coaster or are you watching everything all at once and having it engulf you you see yep that's the experience yeah and and you can you can go for that at a polo match or a horse show a dog show <laughs> you can go into a big crowd of people in in anything that's anything where there's a lot of people and that's what you have to face up to when you shop at the mall that's what happens to you you know that's what happens to you can you actually go to the mall and buy a pair of shoes and go home? not that easy you see mm -hmm. but in the old days you went to the street where the shoes are on that street and you would you would be not you would be more comfortable doing it the way it's set up in india it's like I go to the lumber yard, all the lumber yards are in a row. <laughs> and if I want a, a new tire or a fender for the car, if I go to the road where they have spare fenders, you know, for your car, they're all together in a row. When I was in, in Sri Lanka, I used to have fun figuring this out. You want to buy a hammer, all the stores in a row are making hammers. You don't have to run all over town to find your hammer. You see. But if you go to a mall, they have different positions. The shoe stores are never all together. Have you ever noticed that? They don't mm -hmm. want you to just buy shoes. They want you to have to go from here to here and then over there and then back there to see their mall, you see? Spread mm -hmm. you out. Yeah. So it's all these things are examples of this. Can you do a task? And they all come back to living. Can you do one task at a time? That's exactly why the office here has been completely gutted, dumped in the hall, and rebuilt last week. <laughs> because I was fractionalized. Now I'm completely organized. I have about, well, sort of, I mean, I have 100 notes on, stuck on the cabinets up here, you know, <laughs> but I'm organized. I can see everything now and do one thing at a time, and I can reach a place to put things away now and actually work one or two things on the desk at a time. But I couldn't mm -hmm. do I couldn't. Everything would just, I made jokes about it because in my old business, when my, when my desk, uh, uh, you know, got one foot deep, 
then they knew I was going to shut the door and put the sign up. Do not disturb under any circumstances and threat of death. <laughs> Do not come through the door because I dump it, everything on the desk, shove it into a box, lock myself in the room and sort it out and start again. Now, uh -huh. and then I can produce. So I'm getting threatened by diversification. And <laughs> But it takes to, you know, that saddest thing in the universe, the saddest thing I ever saw was the title housewife. It's a sad thing. You sad, sad level in society, sad title, sad everything. In the United States during the women's liberation movement, it was one of the few things they did was right, was they tried to abolish the label of housewife away for women so that they either became a domestic and uh, let's see a home executive or a domestic engineer those are the two titles they could take one or the other they could claim they were a full-time home executive or a ceo for the house and one woman her you know she said what does that mean i said you're the ceo your sister is the um the vice president or the pres vice president of the uh the house house uh, organization but she's she's the, she's the ceo she was this uh the um home executive what happened in the house we had to tell her she was the home executive and her husband was the ceo because he got <laughs> <laughs> but the other, the other, the other one, we told her she was a domestic engineer hired under the home executive. And then the children, they had diversifications and they had titles. Everybody was happy. Everybody was a manager of making beds or a manager of cleaning or a manager of helping to clean up the kitchen. They, everybody was a manager. Okay. <laughs> it was a wonderful experiment. He got upset when I told him she was the home executive. I said, it's not a problem. You call you happen. We we made our home executive because you are the CEO. And then he said, "Oh, okay, <laughs> happy again." <laughs> so you get the idea of this, you. You get the idea. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. The big thing is, is thinking about how do the lessons take you home? You know, how are they taking you into life? Are you taking them into life and applying them? And so you actually using the text every time you hear one of these stories, what happened? Now he has all these comparisons of, of uh, the stories that were related to for them to remember. You see? And, and then if you go back to 22, I'll take you to one more and, uh, that is very, I think it's perfect. It's absolutely marvelous. The problem in, in Alagadupa Masuta in number 22, the problem was Arati, the monk Arati had a problem. And his problem was he believed that when Hindus came up, it was okay to disobey orders of Buddha. He didn't understand the Buddhas, what he claimed. He didn't understand him. He said to the Buddha, I thought you said it was okay to engage a hindrance. And the Buddha makes the statement, misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct you if you engage in them? is what it says. So this could not be any clearer stated that the Buddha was saying about him, abandon them, relinquish them, let them go, leave them alone. Don't engage them. Do not ever engage them because they take you away from the actual meditation you're doing. So is this just for twim? Certainly not. If uh, I, the, most of the people I met in teaching since 2009 for myself, the ones who were in such trouble with the hindrances were breathing meditators who were in trouble. Now, if the breathing meditator all of a sudden finds out what the Buddha actually said, do not ever engage a hindrance. And then in this book alone, there are 11 other suttas 
And the key solution in every one of those suttas is to abandon the hindrance, abandon it. And why should we do that? He's teaching you about a Nietzsche in the process of training you. Whatever arises, passes away, always. It's always true. So why would you stop and go over here and let go of the, the breath or let go of your metta with your spiritual friend and then come and say that you actually did sit for 45 minutes or an hour when it turns out that in that hour you left the friend alone, you left him alone and you went over to the hindrance for maybe two, three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and if you did that, why did you go over there when you were supposed to be over here with your spiritual friend or watching the breath? Why? And so this has become a major piece that has changed across time. And uh, it has been a, what I call a slippage across the history line. And somewhere somebody said, we have to fight these things. We have to defend ourselves. They're attacking us. And yet, if you were, let's say you did try to stop them and make them stay out of the picture, if they never come in the picture to get to you at all, in the process of your training, you will never have the experience of them allowing you to see craving arise. Well, what's so important about that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this suffering is caused by the craving and the clinging. And the craving is set off by the I don't like this. I don't want this or I want it. The craving to get it or craving to stop it is the personalization of what's happening inside. So the, my suggestion is don't believe me. <laughs> Seriously, don't believe me. But practice as an experiment, what happens if I decide nothing should be taken personally? What happens if I practice with the perspective of view, which by the way is right view, just as it's described. If I have an impersonal view of things and I don't take it personally, no, then no, you're training the mind not to have that tension and tightness arise with the rising of the craving. It's not gonna happen. It's gonna slow down if you do it every single time. So if I come to retreats, I'm going to get cured. No, you're not. Only if you come to the hospital and have the baby and take it home and take care of it, are you going to have the child grow up? <laughs> so, so if what I'm saying is if you go to the retreat to learn the meditation and you find the silent place where you're not there, you need to take it home and take care of it as much as possible so you need to know as much of the teaching the Buddha gave the knowledge, you have to have enough of that knowledge to understand how it all works. How does that craving arrive and how does it come up and what is the construct of it? And then the hindrance, what is the hindrance? How does it operate? And we have lots that tell us it precisely what happens if we pay attention to it and what happens if we don't? And if we let it go and abandon it, relinquish it, release it, allow it, let it be, become calm, stay there. And anything that comes up, smile at it, let it go, relax, smile, come back. See? Sounds too easy, I know, that's the problem. <laughs> But it works. It retrains the brain if you start doing it and using it all the time at work and at home and when you're driving and when you're dealing with people. Anybody? Any other questions? Fire away.
Okay, the one I was going to tell you in Alagadupama that's so famous is to remember if the Buddha tells you how to take care of a snake, then if somebody explains to you how to remove a snake out of your yard, always remember this. It says if you pick the snake up by its tail, you see, and it's hanging down and the head is down here, it will curl around itself and bite you and then you will die. That's what he said. But if you pick the snake up by the head properly, then you can move the snake without hurting yourself or hurting the snake and put it in another location where it can find some food easily, okay? And leave it alone. There's no reason to kill the snake. Relocate it. But if you pick it up the wrong way, it bites you. And if you, if you, uh, yeah, the other one they told, told us uh, about is another story. I'll save that for another time. Okay, are we done? Yes, we are done. So we are going to try to keep making some smaller talks. And uh, this is very nice, I think, this time, right? Is it good? I think it is. Okay. Yes. Uh, so we're going to be trying to make shorter talks. So I won't have quite as much repetition sometimes in the suttas. And then we will have the question section, a separate piece. So we try to get closer to an hour or a little less on our talks. And I want to thank you for your cooperation. Let your friends know that Sister Kema stopped talking. <laughs> well, she stopped talking so much and she's going to get shorter. Come on, let's be blunt here. Sister Kema is going to turn it shorter, okay? Good. Okay, so let's say a prayer together. May suffering once be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu.